Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I had a great conversation with Fadim Gladyshev, professor at Harvard Medical School, where his research ranges from ageing, lifespan control, rejuvenation to selenium and redox biology. We dig deeper into these different areas in this video. So hi Fadim, thank you so much for joining me today and yeah, Hello. welcome to the Shiki Science Show. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's great. Yeah, I, I watched a couple of episodes and really enjoyed it. So, oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've read a lot of your research, um, both your research articles and your review articles. And I just thought I'd start with um, a really interesting concept that you mention in a review article, which is that you describe aging as being akin to gravity. It's a fundamental force that uh, can't truly be reversed. And so I was just wondering if that's still your your understanding of aging and whether or not you could elaborate on that a bit more. Sure, man. It, it, it's nice that you found this metaphor because it was already published uh, eight years ago, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I still think this way, uh, but this metaphor, of course, was meant to distinguish aging and lifespan control because often things are mixed up and when the... Um, find a gene that uh, affects lifespan. For example, if we knock out or express a gene and affects lifespan, we kind of say it, 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 it kind of defines aging. I, I think it's not. It defines lifespan and aging is, is, is a kind of a, a different, I would say orthogonal kind of direction in, in that space. So and that's that's what I meant yeah, by, by this metaphor, meaning that uh, the aging would be equivalent to gravity. So there are different question, questions, whether organism ages or not, and how long it lives. There's a, two completely different questions in my mind. Okay, and so I guess on from this, um, a lot of your work now has uh, focused on trying to talk about biological age and actually trying to quantify aging. And so um, what what does it mean to actually quantify age and what do you think are like the, the best approaches to do so? Yeah, that's a very nice question. So a difficult one, actually. So. Um, yeah, because uh, there's no consensus on, on what aging is. Yeah, so apparently uh, scientists in the field, various scientists, they feel differently about the aging process. When we say we quantify aging, uh, also they mean different things. So some, some people think quantifying, for example, functional decline, and some people think, think of quantifying a chance of dying, you know, the, the, the change in the chance of dying uh, over time. Some people think about like damage accumulation. So, and to me, um, uh, these are still, of course, uh, 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 in a way, questions that are being studied. In my mind, my thinking is that the essence of aging is damage, uh, or more broadly, age-related negative consequences of being alive. I, I put it sometimes this way. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, kind of in integrative parameters of that, uh, features of that, like mortality, for example, or functional decline, is a consequence of, of damage accumulation. And sometimes they go hand in hand, and sometimes they do not. So in a way, I think uh, aging is, is not well represented, for example, by mortality. So it's, uh, of course, uh, I, I would say, I'm saying very, you know, <laughs> maybe extreme, uh, extreme things, but, uh, there are, in, in the field, there is all this, you know, um, uh, body of work that involves, you know, Gompertz equation and all of these uh, various mathematical models, evolutionary models, but then, and they all kind of link to mortality. But when, if you look at the mortality in more detail, we see that it's uh, very, um, you know, sometimes very uh, unusual patterns. So, for example, if you look at the uh, human mortality, uh, initially it decreases, like after a person is born, it decreases. Uh, it has a minimum at, at the age of nine. Uh, and then uh, it, has, uh, uh, it stops increasing at the age of 20, especially in males. And then after maybe 25, 30, it, it increases again. And so evolutionary biologists, you know, kind of fail to explain it in, in, a, in a good way. Because they say, well, we should not, of course they say we should not consider uh, development because it's not aging. And then we should not consider age between 20 and 25 because it's a hormones and then uh, they say uh, you know there's a 
like uh, negligibly senescent animals or like uh, negative senescence. I, I don't know what negative senescence means. You know, uh, how, for example, if you look at the turtles or some fishes, mortality decreases with age and, and, and fecundity increases. So, but does it mean that the organisms become young? I don't think so. I think they become older, but the mortality still decreases. What I mean is that uh, we need to distinguish th these features of aging. So in humans, when we uh, look at the late in late life or second half of life, uh, all of these features, they uh, go in parallel. Mortality, functional decline, you know, fitness, uh, damage accumulation, and then therefore maybe in some way they, they may all be kind of used to quantify aging. But, uh, but early life, they are not. They, they are clearly different. And so what is then aging? So, and, and that kind of leads to these quantitative tools, like a clocks, a PCD clocks. A PCD clocks is the best tool in my mind that kind of can integrate the aging process. It, it's still not perfect, of course, and there are various clocks that measure various aspects of aging. It's just better than what we had before. And then with these clocks, epigenetic, but also transcriptomic and maybe some other clocks, we are able to address completely new questions. Like, for example, when does aging begin? or uh, what's the rate of aging uh, in individual tissues, or how can we target aging in, in different periods of life, including development. All of these questions can, can be at least asked with these new tools, and it was not possible before in my mind. Yeah, that's a really good uh, answer, and you've now just raised many questions that I want to follow up on. So I guess the first one, um, you've alluded to these like negligible senescence or organisms that don't appear to age. One of them that I know you've researched is the naked mole rats. And you published a paper, I think, at the end of last year that showed you looked at the DNA methylation age of the blood of naked mole rats. And whilst initially, if you look at the mortality rates, they, they don't appear to age. Based on the methylation, you do still see this aging. So I guess, um, yeah, could you elaborate on the findings from this paper and what that means for understanding, yeah, the aging process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, first, there, there, there have been two papers. Uh, there is so one paper that we published in Nature Communications uh, and then another paper uh, uh, led to Horvath and Vera Gorbanova in, in Nature Aging, uh, basically, the same conclusions that um, it is possible to construct an epigenetic clock and possible to quantify uh, genetic aging in the naked mole rat. Um, and we kind of relate this to the previous data from the Shelley Buffenstein's lab that showing that mortality of naked mole rats does not increase with age. And uh, the reason we actually wanted to um, to study this is exactly to to begin addressing the questions of whether naked mole rats uh, age. Uh, in the literature, it's often we can find um, a, uh, a statement that naked mole rats, they have uh, constant mortality rate, uh, mar constant mortality rate, and therefore they do not age. Uh, to me, it's, it's a very strange because this is a mammal. So mammal has uh, you know, uh, irreplaceable cells and structures, you know, some live cells like neurons or cardiomyocytes. So of course they, they, would, they, they would age <laughs> and therefore, uh, or like a skeleton would age, you know, there is an eye. And, and, and so there are many, many elements they must age because this is the way the physiology of, physiology of mammals is kind of evolved. Uh, therefore, how, how come they do not age based on the mortality? So, but based on this epigenetic uh, clocks, it seems like they do age. It's just uh, the mortality does not change. And that's exactly points to this challenge of how we relate aging to mortality. Exactly. And I think it raises an interesting question about trying to distinguish aging versus like just continued development. Or do you think that the, there is a clear distinguishment between the two? Yeah, I, I think there is very clear. So, so what I think is first, uh, in my mind, aging is not a continued development. So, of course, there are various concepts in the field that, that suggest uh, the case, evolutionary models, for example, disposable soma hyperfunction theory. Uh, to me, again, aging is, uh, is an unavoidable consequence of being alive. So we have a, a program, like, for example, developmental program. There are certain genes in that program that are needed uh, 
you know, to support this program. So if you delete a gene, let's say, that is involved in development, development would stop. There are no such genes in aging. So we cannot delete a gene to stop aging or overexpress a gene to stop aging. So, um, and therefore, in my mind, uh, let's say during development, there is a program, uh, there is a, it has a purpose, that program to, uh, to basically prepare a, a competing in individual uh, uh, and then uh, a fit individual. And then uh, there is a consequence of that is aging because during development, cells are metabolically active. They produce byproducts and other negative consequences of metabolism. Um, and, uh, and these features, they accumulate. And that's what we quantify and define as, as aging. So of course we, uh, you know, need to ask uh, questions: How this this aging, kind of molecular aging, in a way, would be related to organismal uh, kind of state? Because it is possible that, for example, uh, damage increases and therefore biological age based on the clocks increases, whereas the organism becomes, uh, more, uh, you know, increases fitness. You know, uh, this is unresolved still. So I, I think uh, additional questions need to be studied uh, at, at that state, at more at the, at the state of uh, like various phases of development. Yeah, that's a really good answer. And so in terms of trying to address these questions, we need, I guess, good experimental tools to be able to do so. And so that brings me back to the DNA methylation approaches and to the a publication that came out from your lab last year, the single cell age, and how you can, you've now developed a, a tool that enables you to measure the age of a single cell and so I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about that I know I've already spoken with Alex on this channel but also maybe talk a bit about the kind of the benefits of having a single cell age as opposed to uh, bulk samples yeah well, I mean because I think you, you can refer to your nice uh, piece with Alex Trapp who who developed this uh, as we call it SCH single cell um, epigenetic aging clock um, and uh, so He's the one who kind of developed the concept and developed the clock. So I, I was just in the office and kind of enjoying, enjoying the process. <laughs> so it's the, all the grades go to him, basically. And, uh, and but of course, uh, uh, you know, the idea here is that uh, aging, uh, you know, cell is the individual um, unit of life. Therefore, aging must happen at the level of cells. And we just wanted to address that question. So when we analyze the bulk tissue, uh, age of the bulk tissue, it is possible that uh, maybe all cells uh, age in, in a certain coordinated way, or maybe it's possible that you know, some cells don't age and some cells age very rapidly and then we get some, some, some average. So, uh, so what is it? That's kind of the questions that we wanted to address. And uh, it is clear that it's both. So <laughs> that uh, there are some cells age more rapidly, some not as rapidly, but they influence each other and, and kind of the whole system kind of progresses. And, but of course, it's just a first study and uh, it, it's a, the very initial clock it needs to be improved further and maybe additional approaches developed. So we are particularly thinking of uh, going multi-omics because currently, just uh, DNA methylation, but uh, there's a, there are still technical limitations. Just uh, the throughput is very low for small teomics currently. And alternatives like ATAC-seq also, uh, ATAC-seq rna -seq has not been really developed yet uh, in terms of the aging parameters, which is another kind of promising area. Anyway, so there are, I think there are many labs are currently working in, in this direction. So hopefully in the future, there the will be something like uh, multi-tissue, uh, single-cell multi-tissue clocks, uh, single-cell multi-omics clocks, and maybe even multi-tissue clocks. I don't know. Yeah. Able to de determine the age of the cells uh, based on maybe one or two omics parameters, but also no information about the state of the cell, you know, cell type and some other characteristics of the cell based on some, some other omics like rna -seq. Exactly, yeah, I think that will give us like another dimension of information to understand what's going on in the cell as well as and like trying to correlate it with the the DNA methylation age and so one of the things I liked about that paper was how you used it to look at very early uh, development and kind of 
so, so I guess validated your idea about this ground zero that there seems to be this rejuvenation, this decline in biological age very early on in development. And so what kind of processes need to happen early in development that and like why why is the age going down at this this point? Yeah. So how it um, happened in our case is that uh, I've, I've been thinking that uh, about aging of germline of germline. So because these are these cells are alive, so I, I suspect that they they would accumulate damage and therefore they would they would age. But then how come the next generation comes? To the uh, you know starts at the same kind of low low age so i i, I, I there's a contradiction here <laughs> somehow and i wasn't sure how to resolve and and uh, um, and then two years ago i was at the conference in, in moscow it was a bioinformatics conference and then uh, somebody was uh, giving a talk on on phylogenetic state uh, in plants uh, it's an evolutionary model uh, during development uh, where uh, organisms acquire uh, a similar a similar state called phylogenetic state for example at the level of uh, vertebrates uh, they're quite different uh, in in uh, gametes and the way gametes look or uh, zygotes look but then during development they acquire this common state called phylogenetic state and there is an evolutionary model called, called uh, our glass model and uh, and and then they, they look very similar very alike uh, uh, and then uh, for example it would be hard to distinguish I don't know, like a turtle embryo uh, at, at that stage from maybe a mouse embryo. And, but then later, of course, they become different again. And so this, this state also is characterized by the expression of the evolutionary oldest genes, uh, also very low variance in gene expression. And I was kind of listening to that talk, talk and then while thinking about aging, and said, I said, it's maybe the same, actually. Of course, th that talk was completely, there was no word aging at all. There was a development in plants, but somehow it just makes sense. So I, and I, I've never taken actually developmental biology in my life as a class. So I went to my division chief and he's a developmental biologist. He gave me the textbooks on developmental biology. So I started reading it. So I learned what, what gastrulation is and other stages. And so, uh, and, and then um, I, you know, I, I wrote this conceptual paper published about a year ago uh, on the on ground zero. And uh, we wanted really to test this uh, idea experimentally. And then uh, uh, Chaba Kiripeshi, who was a postdoc in, in the lab, he just very skillfully uh, was able to address this experimentally by basically uh, quantifying biological age by using various uh, clocks and kind of following biological age as a function of development. And he could, could see this basically all the clocks. The, the effect is very striking that uh, the zygote uh, biological age is not zero. It's quite low, but not zero. And then it decreases. So uh, the differences between this initial conceptual model and the actual data, uh, apparently I initially thought that the age would decrease right away after conception. Uh, for example, during like initial stages of cleavage, the, I thought, okay, maybe it would already be decreasing, but, but it's not, at least based on this epigenetic clocks. It stays more or less the same, and then it sharply drops later, uh, already after implantation, when uh, like approximately at the stage of gastrulation. And then also Alex Trapp uh, applied his uh, SCH approach to, um, uh, to, to, to to study how biological age changes uh, during development. And again, we observed the same thing: it, the biological age decreases. So it's very gratifying that you know you initially kind of think about this idea and then it turns out to be correct of course it still needs to be validated by other labs i mean it's still possible that we like like always in science we can we can never be 100 percent sure yeah so we always have to be skeptical and it would be good if some other labs test it and validate or extend but if this is true i, I think i think it's very very important because uh, this is the kind of the first natural rejuvenation event somehow cells are at a higher biological age and then they decrease biological age. So how do they do it? What's the mechanism? Is it related to uh, epigenetic reprogramming, uh, this Yamanaka-like approach? Uh, if, 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 especially if it's not, then maybe possible to find common features about these two reprogramming processes. And this would, uh, would allow us to better understand uh, what is rejuvenation? How can we maybe apply similar strategies to somatic cells 
and so on. I think the implications are, are, are very big if this is true. Yeah, for sure. And it was really interesting to hear your backstory to it. Um, it was really cool. And so I guess it, what, what it demonstrates, though, is that early development, which I guess was kind of already known, is a very sensitive time uh, to changes. And so, I mean, do you think that there's obviously variations, like even like within the human population as to this very early stage and how maybe, you know, early development and slight differences and how far the reprogramming or the, the decrease in the age goes has an implication for like our total uh, lifespan? Yeah, that's also a good question. Of course, in, in this conceptual paper, I, I discussed this possibility that uh, that maybe they could interfere with the uh, rejuvenation process and perhaps um, prove it further to, to basically to kind of start aging at the lowest possible, maybe lower than the, what naturally occurs, biological age. Um, we, are, we are exploring this idea, but th there's no answer yet. Uh, and and uh, and it, of course, it is also possible that even if we decrease biological age initially, even to a lower level, uh, we don't know whether it would actually impact uh, aging later in life. We are not sure because it would be uh, like very low or extremely low. And if the, if, for example, uh, damage accumulates at a similar rate, then this kind of difference will be would be negligible later in life. This is also possible. So, or, or maybe it would. We just kind of staying in the same trajectory, it begins lower and continues lower. That's also possible. Uh, both are possibilities, but we just don't know the answer. But yes, we are thinking about it, how to um, kind of amplify it, how, how to extend it, uh, this, this rejuvenation process. Yeah, that's a really good point. But um, it kind of leads me on to a recent uh, preprint that's come out of your lab that's treated uh, mice and then I think as well uh, Daphne or Drosophila, I quite, can't quite remember, but um, you treated uh, uh, mice as soon as they were born with rapamycin. Um, and what was seen, so after this like early um, intervention with, rap <coughs> with rapamycin, you saw that it influenced both their health span and lifespan. And so I was just wondering, I mean, one seems to validate your idea, but also could you elaborate a bit more about what you found in this, this publication? Yeah, but this publication happened actually just because uh, we analyzed lifespan and, and it's, it takes three years. So, of course, we started this way before that. And the reason we started is that uh, uh, Tasia Shindyapina, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, uh, she uh, kind of approached me and with this idea, it was her idea. She said, let's let's try reprovising early in development. I, I wasn't sure because we haven't studied this before, but somehow she was able to convince me that it was a good idea. <laughs> and we were not sure for three years if it would work or not. And, and later, uh, and it turns out to be that the lifespan is extended. So we're very happy about it. And then we uh, also collaborated with Leon Peshkin's lab at, uh, here at uh, the Department of Systems Biology, uh, who on Daphne and they basically have done a similar experiment to Daphne and, and found the same same thing that uh, treatment uh, early life treatment with rapamycin kind of delays growth uh, and uh, and and, therefore, and eventually it extends lifespan in, in both organisms what is interesting uh, there was another paper this actually submitted to bioarchive back to back um, if amazing that was I was contacted by a lab in Italy to help with uh, omics analysis and in the conversation, they realized that actually we have very similar data. Uh, so they also treated uh, with uh, rapamycin early in life and also extended lifespan. What is nice that in our case, uh, they used uh, EMH3 mice, which is uh, it's a heterogeneous mice cross of four inbred lines. And they let just used uh, one inbred line and we used uh, rapamycin in the food. They injected rapamycin. We had like from zero to 30. 30 Zero to forty-five days, and then they had from zero to thirty, and from thirty to sixty. So basically, it's very complementary study. So it's really nice that uh, different models, different feeding procedures, and they also have done it in flies, and we've done it in that. It's just kind of very complementary, and the same same findings in all organisms. So we are very happy about it. I think it gives, gives confidence that it's true. The, the findings are correct. Yeah. So, uh, but of course, uh, it has not been reviewed yet. It is peer reviewed. So now the paper has been submitted and let's see what the reviewers will say. 
that's, that's true. Um, I guess one of the, the striking findings, though, is that uh, the mice that were treated early in development with rapamycin, um, so rapamycin, for my audience who don't know, it inhibits uh, the protein mTOR, and that's involved in regulating cell growth. But when the young mice were treated for the short time periods, it also caused them to be smaller in general. Is that, is that correct? Yes. So does that kind of confirm the idea that there does maybe seem to be some trade-off between um, growth and aging? Yes, uh, it confirms, but I, I think the, ultimately growth is still one of the characteristics, I think. It's not, a, I mean, we, we see many exceptions, like Nick Moretz, for example, as we discussed, they are small animals, but they live long. Um, yeah, so yeah. Uh, I think there is a connection, but again, so I think it's just not one-to-one -one con uh, connection here. But uh, also, uh, like, we could inhibit cell growth for, for, for various reasons, you know, and uh, maybe some of them, when we actually truly develop, uh, the slow down uh, the development, then we may extend lifespan, but we also may inhibit growth for various reasons, just would be really damaging. And, and, and therefore, actually, I spend maybe shorter in this case. Yeah, I see. And that's it's, why I think you saw it's kind, uh, of, it kind of also relates to, for example, dwarfism. So, like in human, there is a dwarfism, but uh, there are different types of dwarfism. Some dwarfism associated with maybe extended health span and potentially lifespan, and, and some are not. And I think as well, you saw uh, sex dependent differences that it seemed to um, have a stronger effect on the male mice and the female mice. Yeah, but we always observe this with many interventions in mice. So it's it just uh, in the ITP program, for example, but uh, many interventions that they tested and uh, the majority of them, um, the majority of interventions that extend lifespan, they actually extend lifespan primarily in males. And this mm -hmm. is what we also observe in our lab. We tested several interventions. That it's much more common to observe lifespan extension in males than in females. So, and, and here is again, this is kind of the same conclusion. So these these uh, findings are like yeah really fascinating and yeah reinforce the idea that early development is very sensitive. But I guess also people could come across this literature and also you know who are going through pregnancy and start to you know maybe worry about these things or, or like how would you ever see um, or not see this information ever kind of translating through to interfering in early development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are thinking about it. Actually, one idea we kind of exploring whether interventions can be tested uh, early in life. So we could subject potentially mice to some interventions and test them during the first like 30 days, for example, by using the machine clocks or following the growth. And this could be a potential screen. Uh, so instead of just uh, waiting for the entire life or, for example, treating old animals because we need old animals for that. But again, so I, I think uh, there are you know, so-called two types of uh, interference. So, and uh, the kind of delayed growth uh, may may not be associated with, with extension of life lifespan. But at least, you know, it's, it would be more likely to extend lifespan. So, I think it, it may be a good idea to test. So, we haven't done we haven't done it. But I, I know some people in C. elegans they they tested this idea. It seems to work as well. So, and of course, uh, now in flies, in Daphne, and in mice. So it seems like a general idea. So I think it would be a useful tool actually uh, in the future. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see that research. Um, so like we've spoken about intervening at early stage of life, but also there's a lot of research looking at trying to um, like uh, use uh, regenerative medicine or uh, rejuvenation technologies later in life to help alleviate different age associated diseases. And so I was just wondering, like to you, what do you think are the main or like most promising strategies in terms of rejuvenative approaches? Mm. Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, we uh, we really don't understand what rejuvenation means, actually. So uh, like even the clocks, uh, the kind of aging clocks, all of the clocks that have been developed so far, they are aging clocks. So they quantify uh, the direction from the young to, to the old state. Uh, whether they would work in the opposite direction, actually it's unclear, it's, it's commonly used. And so we use, of course, as well, and 
we kind of assume that uh, if we uh, subject uh, a system, biological system like cells or mice to some treatment and observe a decreased biological age, we assume it's a rejuvenation. Um, uh, I think uh, there's one component of that is rejuvenation, but not, not, not the entire kind of response. So what, I, what I'm thinking is that we need to develop um, uh, clocks that would be more tuned to, do, to test for rejuvenation. So some kind of rejuvenation clocks. Such clocks do not exist yet. And because uh, when we look, uh, when we kind of think about the aging process uh, and quantify it, these clocks would necessarily be a composite kind of uh, composite clocks. Uh, uh, some changes, age related changes would be, uh, would, would, would be damaging, would, would be uh, true aging. Some would be neutral changes, but they still could quantify the aging process. And some would be uh, adaptive, or like we call them adaptive or protective changes that, uh, that are activated in response to age related changes, like the kind of the system finds a new homeostatic state in, in a way. So they could still quantify aging, but they would have nothing to do with rejuvenation. So I sometimes give this um, a metaphor uh, of using um, um, adaptive changes in the form of like a glasses or hearing aid or like a walking cane or some, some other features. And we could develop potentially a clock based on this. Uh, you know, maybe collect uh, parameters, maybe 10 or 20 parameters like that and give away to each parameter and quantify aging. I think it you know, would be quite reasonable accuracy. Uh, and then we would fire all of the doctors. There is no doctors, no glasses, no hearing aid. And based on this, everybody is rejuvenated because the, the way, but it's not, yeah? So this means that uh, aging changes have many, many features and only some of them quantify, truly represent aging and therefore would represent rejuvenation. So when we apply existing clocks and we see rejuvenation, there's a clearly there's a component of it, but, uh, Cannot be hundred percent sure because we don't know the contribution. I don't know if it's explained clearly or not. But uh, anyway, so we need a new generation of machine clocks which are specific for rejuvenation. They simply do not exist, and I don't think anybody. At least I haven't heard people even kind of conceiving this idea. Just kind of asking a question that we need a different type of clock, and then by using this clock we could we could address uh, better address rejuvenation. So clear rejuvenation is possible because we know this uh, developmental rejuvenation, embryonic rejuvenation, we know Yamanaka type rejuvenation. And uh, I suspect there will be some other types as well. Uh, and we are working on it as well, uh, but I think many, many labs are working on it. Uh, and we need to better understand, better quantify it. And, and then, uh, you know, once it's done, then we could, broaden up and develop screening approaches and so on, but we just don't have essential tools yet for that. Yeah, that's, no, that's super interesting. And so one question I was going to ask was, how would you like validate such a rejuvenation clock? But then I was thinking, we've just spoken about early development and that early rejuvenation process. Is that not something that we could potentially use to develop a rejuvenation clock or not? Yeah, but you, but you see, it goes back to the what we discussed earlier, like on the in the essence of aging. So what do we mean by age? So, and uh, if we, uh, again, so I may be wrong, but this is my thinking, it's, it's a damage, right? And so if we focus on quantifying this uh, damage or negative consequence of, of metabolism or being alive, then we follow aging. Therefore, we could follow rejuvenation as well based on this. If we are able to distinguish various age related changes. What I don't like is that there are so many papers, so many studies when somebody just look in a particular a gene, for example, some metabolite and observe, okay, that gene uh, decreased with age. Let's bring it back to the youthful level and call it rejuvenation. To me, it's simply nonsense. We, we cannot be sure because we don't know if that age change is negative, positive, or neutral. It just cannot say anything uh, based on this. We need to distinguish which one is which. Uh, and yeah, so... In general, I, I think uh, in the aging field, we just need more uh, kind of fundamental uh, studies, kind of um, conceptual studies, just kind of trying, trying to define the aging process because ultimately this is essence. 
So many people claim that we already know everything about uh, aging. We just need to develop quickly interventions. I, I think this is also wrong. We need more fundamental studies. We need more funding into the basic biology of aging. Uh, not really translational yet. I mean, translation is also good. I mean, this this may actually increase funding for the field, but we need basic work. We need to build the, the foundation for, for the field, which does not exist. That's, yeah, really well said. I mean, I... Is, is, it, is it amazing that, you know, I was at the conference two years ago and there was a questionnaire given about to define aging to researchers in the field, and everybody gives a different definition of aging. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just, yeah. It's just amazing. So we disagree at the very fundamental level. So we need to work on that and really to try to find consensus or develop or do some experiments to at least to clarify this, this basic, basic problem. Exactly. No, that was really well said. And so um, obviously, yeah, there is a, a lot of research. And I was just uh, wondering, you've done some work on like naked mole rats. You've done work on human cells. Is there any model organism that you would love to work on or think would really help us to address some of these questions? You know, we, we're thinking of, yeah, about other organisms. Uh, over the years, actually, I worked with maybe 20 different organisms, all the way from bacteria, archaea, flies, yeast. We work on yeast actually in the lab currently also. It actually, it's a very good model organism. I really like it. Single cell uh, eukaryote, it ages, and so many things can be done at a very basic level. Um, but we are focusing basically on, on mice, primarily mice, um, and uh, a little bit on human, make more rats and yeast. This is our current. Uh, there is one ongoing project on axolotl as well. So, and actually on xenopus. Yeah, you're right. There is uh, some that we work on. <laughs> we work on a few. Cool. Oh, yeah, I guess axolotls would be an interesting one to further understand rejuvenation, right? Because they have like limb regeneration. Is that correct? Uh, what um, ax and axolotls? They have a uh, lot of limb yeah. regeneration. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so and uh, uh, we want to address the question of the relationship between uh, regeneration and rejuvenation. That's another big question in the field, in my mind. What's the relationship between these two? Uh, uh, it's still unresolved. But I think there are some good models for it. Uh, both both mammals, but but things like axolotl, for example, as well. Um, so I want to like shift gears slightly to, I guess, maybe some more uh, older work now that you published about selenium and selenoproteins. So okay. could you firstly, I guess, introduce a bit of background to selenoproteins? Oh, yeah. So I guess my lab is actually best known for, for, the, for the studies on selenium. Yeah, so we worked on this for a long time. I started when I was a postdoc. I was working with uh, Theresa Statman. Uh, and later with Dolph Hatfield at NIH as a postdoc studying um, uh, selenium proteins. And when I started my lab, the first question that we asked is, uh, uh, what's the number of selenium proteins in mammals? Because at that time, researchers tried to understand the effects of dietary selenium through a couple of known selenium proteins, but there was no understanding on the on the number of these proteins and what they do. And uh, so I had a a very talented graduate student uh, in the lab, Gregory Krukov, who developed uh, a computational approach. We call it Sikis Search. Uh, Sikis is the it's RNA structure in the three prime UTR of selenium protein genes, uh, which kind of is needed to reprogram the ribosome so that uh, it uh, uses UGA codon, which is normally a stop codon. Uh, instead, uses it to insert selenium cysteine. So selenium cysteine, we call it the twenty-first amino acid in the genetic code because it's encoded by, uh, by a codon. So it's a co-translational insertion of selenium cysteine into protein. And um, so he developed this approach and we were able to identify uh, genes. Uh, and we found that uh, in the human, there are 25 selenium protein genes, uh, like in the mouse 24, and actually, actually uh, characterized many, actually all completely sequenced genomes. Like for example, in the flies, there are three, in C. elegans one, in yeast zero, um, Anyway, uh, and, and that paper was published 19 years ago. It's a, a, our most famous paper published in Science, where we said that there, there are 25 human selenium protein genes. 
And as of today, actually, there are still 25. It seems we have only missed a single one, and all of them were predicted correctly. Mm-hmm. And, and then they realized that uh, serenocysteine is always located in the active site of thyl oxidoreductases, or oxidoreductases were like analogous to those which have cysteine. And it does some kind of uh, redox catalysis. And, uh, and the known examples are, you know, thyridoxin reductase, for example, a protein that reduces thyridoxin, which is the main protein that controls uh, the reduced state of cysteines uh, in proteins in, in the cell. And there is a protein called methanin sulfoxide reductase, which reduce, reduces oxidatively damaged methanin residues. There is a family of proteins called uh, thyroid hormone deiodinase. Uh, there are three such enzymes which uh, activate and inactivate thyroid hormone. But it's, but it's all, it's a reductive deiodination uh, process. So it's always redox or glutathione peroxidase. So we have these common features. That's how I realized, okay, I actually am in the redox biology area. So we expanded uh, into redox biology and uh, was, uh, actually I'm still a, I have this title, director of the Center for Redux Medicine, for that reason. <laughs> and then uh, and then because of this redux, uh, you know, I somehow, you know, uh, moved to the aging field. That was a, always like natural, natural transition from selenium to redux to aging. Uh, I it, it was never a change, like a dramatic change. It's kind of just a flow, almost like a flow. But once we um, uh, started studying aging, it's just so interesting. Uh, so fundamental. It's actually very hard to convince people to study anything else once they kind of taste what this is. It's just, yeah, it's the most interesting. So, yeah, th- that's how it happened. But we still continue working on selenium, trying to understand over the years. We, for example, published many papers on identifying genes which are involved in selenium cysteine biosynthesis. Actually, it was only resolved about 15 years ago when. Um, we identified a couple of genes, and then uh, experimentally, uh, it was uh, kind of uh, the pathway was reconstituted in the lab of Dolph Hatfield at NIH. Um, it's actually interesting that selenocysteine is built on the tRNA. Uh, the, 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 there's a selenocysteine tRNA initially oh, okay. isolated with serine, then serine is phosphorylated, and then selenocysteine is built on that tRNA and then inserted into protein. So if you, for example, feed uh, animals with selenocysteine, like a free, free amino acid, actually it would need to be degraded to selenide and rebuilt on the tRNA. Only then it can be inserted. And uh, the functions of many selenoproteins are still unknown. Uh, we identified some of them over the years, and um, but many of them, yeah. Still need, but it's always redox. It seems like redox is a common theme still. Yeah, I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, biochemistry, especially uh, with like how it's incorporated into the amino acid in the first place, given that UGA, as you say, is a stop codon, which would basically stop protein production. So um, I guess one, I read a paper recently about uh, selenoprotein P, and I believe that's the P stands, or maybe it doesn't stand for it, but because it's in the blood plasma. And yes. so it's, it's a, mm-hmm. okay, cool. Well, um, and I think it, I guess it relates to more like systemic signaling and also maybe influences neurogenesis in the brain. And so uh, do you know more to the story or? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting protein. Uh, yeah, it's primarily synthesized in the liver. Uh, in, in humans, it has 10 selenocysteine residues. That's the only protein which has more than one. And the reason is that um, it has a selenocysteine rich kind of tail. Uh, it, this is the way to deliver selenium from, from the liver where this protein is made to peripheral tissues. And then the protein is degraded there and, and then selenocysteine is used for biosynthesis of selenoproteins. Uh, there are examples of Selenoprotein P in some organisms is just one selenocysteine residue in human 10, but uh, there's a one in, 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 in oyster, for example, in, in certain oysters, which has more than 100 selenocysteine residues in the protein. Wow. Yeah, so uh, no, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, uh, we do not really, I mean, we have a few papers on that protein, but it's not our major target. So, but there are some other labs that work on it. Cool. So the idea is like, so we only get selenium from our diet. And so I guess it's like broken down in the liver and that's why it's selenium protein peas mainly synthesized there to then, yeah. I guess, deliver it to other tissues that then need 
there's like different lino proteins for redox reactions? I would uh, yes, but I would say that the major implication of our work is that uh, because we know a full set of selenium proteins, uh, we could explain why selenium is needed. It's it's only needed for for the function of these twenty five proteins, and that's it. So this is the difference, for example, between selenium and many other trace elements, like for example zinc. I mean, there are hundreds of proteins which utilize zinc, but we actually don't know the number for sure. Mm. Or like iron or in, in or molybdenum, it's not fully clear like how many proteins actually exist that utilize a particular trace element. In the case of selenium, it's very clear because we, we have this particular RNA structure in the three prime UTR and, and uh, so, so we clearly know. And so therefore we could fully explain uh, selenium. Selenium is, of course, is a, an essential trace element. If you look in the multivitamin mixtures, then you always see selenium there, but, you know, along with other vitamins and elements. And the reason is because of these 25 proteins. And also it makes a very convenient tool because we could manipulate selenium in the diet. Like in mice, we often use a selenium deficient diet or selenium enriched diet. And therefore we could manipulate the expression of various proteins in a targeted way. There is a hierarchy, for example, like brain and testes, they have the priori high, high priority for selenium. So even under selenium deficiency, brain selenium level is constant, whereas the liver may lose up to 99% of selenium because it's utilized for other organs. Um, protein P is synthesized and kind of selenium is sent to other places. Um, yeah, and then within, within the cell, there is a hierarchy. Some proteins are more important. Within the cell, for example, proteins like thyridoxin reductase or glutathione peroxidase 4, which is now is a very famous protein because of ferroptosis. It's a key protein. Mm -hmm. It's a new, new form of cell death. Uh, and uh, uh, the most important protein in, in this pathway is, is called GPX4, phospholipid hydroperoxide glutathione peroxidase. And uh, it, it's, a, it's dependent on selenium. So that's why selenium is also needed to protect against teraptosis, actually. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear about uh, selenium. And so I feel like we've we've covered like lots of different topics, um, but are there any other areas, I guess, of like aging research that you also think are either interesting that you want to study for like, or you feel like we need more understanding such as like the gut microbiome, for example? Oh, yeah, got my. Uh, there are so many interesting areas in, in, in the Asian field. Many, many interesting topics. Gut microbiome is, is very interesting as well. Uh, we uh, we work a little bit, but not not really. It's, it's not our um, major target. Uh, let's say it's, it would be very interesting. Uh, um, uh, I, I don't know. We are interested in many questions. For example, uh, when we rejuvenate, so let's say we rejuvenate organism. Uh, this would probably mean that it would be a rejuvenation of particular cells. Or maybe if you replace an organ, uh, it would be a rejuvenation of that organ. Let's say if you replace like an old liver with the young liver. Yeah? How would it affect the uh, age of the entire organism? So if one tissue is younger than the other, because presumably they would interact. Um, so, yeah, so that's why we interested interested in the uh, parabiosis model because that's actually another very clear example of rejuvenation. Right, yeah. actually, the, this is probably the most dramatic that, that we observed so far. So when we connect, um, we have a paper in, in BioArchive when the, um, it's a collaboration with Jim White and Duke, uh, when we connect young and old for a longer period, like three months, and then separate them and follow for another few months, we observe that uh, old mice are still in the rejuvenated state. They're still younger. And they also live longer as well. Um, so what, what is that mechanism? So, and what is the contribution of various factors? Is it uh, access to the young organs or it's uh, blood cells or plasma? And what's the relative contribution of all of, all of these features? Uh, and uh, we have a collaboration on some um, studies to uh, replace or add organs, for example. That's another very, very cool topic in which we also ad address this kind of fundamental features in, in the aging space, how like various aging modalities, they interact with one another within the organism. There are many, many interesting questions. Uh, I would say it's a really cool area. So yeah, just also very exciting to be in the field when there are so many new tools available, which we're not, I'm kind of jealous to young scientists because I wish we could, we could have this 
tools earlier if we could use them, but now it's just great to be. And that's why they're so interested in all these companies and uh, uh, philanthropy and just so on, because I think people realize that there is a potential here in the field. Yeah, for sure. And like speaking of, I guess, like younger scientists, you've had a really incredible career so far and published lots of really awesome work. Uh, I was just wondering, do you have any advice for, I guess, younger scientists or anyone listening who, yeah, advice for either conducting research or uh, beyond that? I don't know. I mean, uh, like my case, it's N1, in the cold one. <laughs> so uh, there's no statistics here. Whatever I can say, it would be, uh, you know, it, it worked. In my case, I, I can say that I, I, I never had any strategy. I just loved science. So and I, I, I like the work. And when, when you like something, you just work on it because it's your work and it's your hobby and it's your way of life. It's all the same. You go to sleep and you think about your scientific problem or you travel and you think about it. And it's more interesting, I don't know, watching movies or like playing games, uh, you know, just incomparably less interesting. So, uh, so and then when, when you think about it, you're focused on this, you do it, you tend to do, do it well. And everything else just somehow happens by itself. So it, that's what happened in, in my life. So I just followed what I liked and everything else kind of worked out by itself. So I, I don't know, if, but it may be a bad example because people always think, okay, they need to have some built networks or some be on certain social media or not Twitter or whatever, podcasts. I don't know, but I don't know if it's good or not. I think ultimately there are many ways. We just need to enjoy what we like, what we do, and and, and hopefully everything will work out. <laughs> no, I completely agree. You know, I think bad having example, passion. Bad example. <laughs> <laughs> passion is definitely important. Um, yeah, I'm enjoying every day of it. That's all. Well, that's, that's all we want to hear. So, I mean, I say thank you, Fadim, again, for yeah coming on to the show today. It's just been a really intriguing conversation, and I'm sure it's probably sparked, like, many ideas into my viewers' minds. It definitely has, like, given me some... Uh, interesting things to think about so I'm just really grateful for to you for taking the time to, to speak with me yeah thank you very much for inviting me to your to your show so it's a really a pleasure and honor to to discuss this with you thank you very much thank you so I hope you've learned something in this video thank you to my patreon supporters and thank you for listening